Hello data pros, welcome back to another episode of our DBT series. In our previous video, we developed a DBT model that retrieves customer information for those with a higher number of orders. Now, we're taking it a step further by enhancing our model to include the total revenue generated by each customer. Furthermore, we will learn the best practices adapted in real-world DBT projects, specifically focusing on the modular approach of splitting our model into multiple smaller models. Additionally, we will establish relationships between our models for efficient data processing and lineage visualization. Let's take a quick look at the ER diagram for our order management system project. So far, we've utilized the first two tables, we now need to include the order items into our data processing. This addition allows us to calculate the total price or revenue by multiplying the order quantity and unit price. Let's begin by creating a new model file called Customer Revenue. Next, we will take the code from our previous customer order model and further enhance it according to our current requirements. This enhancement will include introducing a join operation with the order items table and adding a new column for revenue calculations. This model meets our requirements, however, in larger projects it's common to develop models with hundreds or even thousands of lines of SQL code. In such cases, breaking down the model into multiple smaller models is a common best practice. This modular approach yields a range of benefits, including improved readability, increased reusability, and easier code maintenance, especially as your project evolves and expands over time. So, let's proceed with dividing our original model into five separate DBT models. The first three models, namely the customer stage, order stage, and order item stage, focus on creating reusable models for the underlying source tables. We could delete the basic customer revenue model since we will now be developing a scalable solution for the same. These models are designed to handle minor field-level transformations, such as creating a full name by concatenating the first name and last name. Please remember to save each model as you develop. The reason we refer to them as reusable models is that once you have defined and implemented the customer's model for example, you can easily reuse it for other future requirements. This promotes code reusability and reduces redundant code development. Project teams may choose to create these base models with additional fields and logic to accommodate potential future requirements. Moving forward, we proceed with the creation of the orders fact model, a pivotal component within our data processing pipeline. This model leverages the power of the ref function to reuse our existing models, order stage, and order item stage. The orders fact model acts as an intermediate layer, facilitating data transformation and aggregation. Finally, we create the customer revenue model which combines the aggregated revenue data from the orders fact model and the customer information from the customer stage model. We have made a strategic decision to employ different materializations for our models. The customer revenue and orders fact models, which involve extensive data processing, are materialized as tables. On the other hand, the initial three stage tables are materialized as views. Views are typically suitable for minor transformations as they are executed at runtime on top of underlying tables and do not occupy additional storage space in your data platform. On the other hand, table materializations are preferable for more intensive transformations. This method involves executing the required transformations and physically storing the resulting data as tables in your data platform. By doing so, the subsequent models or processes can benefit from improved performance. When deciding between table or view materializations, it is crucial to carefully evaluate your project requirements, performance considerations, and storage limitations. Striking the right balance between performance and storage is the key. My data platform comprises three distinct layers, landing, processing, and consumption. We intend to place all intermediate models in the processing layer and the final customer revenue table in the consumption layer. 
This placement within the consumption layer of our data platform allows seamless retrieval and utilization by business users. Let's explore how we can customize the materialization and schema for our individual models in the dbtproject.yaml file. By default, all the models are materialized as views. So, we basically need to override this behavior only for the models that require table materialization. In terms of schema placement, the profile.yaml file already defines the default target schema, which in my case is the consumption layer. To place intermediate models in the processing layer, I'll need to override the target schema for those models. Overriding the target schema in dbt is not straightforward due to certain deliberate design considerations. You can refer to this official web link in the description for more details on this topic. However, as a workaround, you can create a macro to enable seamless schema overrides. We will cover the concept of macro later, but for now please copy this code from the description and create a macro file, as I do. If a custom schema is configured for a model, dbt concatenates the default schema name from the profile.yaml file with the custom schema name specified in the dbtproject.yaml file. With this macro, we aim to modify this default behavior by removing the concatenation logic. We are ready to run our models. We have two options. Trigger the dbt run command to run all the models in the current project. Or execute the dbt run models plus customer revenue command, which will execute all the preceding models referenced and finally run the customer revenue model itself. Let's check the log to see which models were run, how they were materialized, and their schema. Everything looks good in the terminal. More execution details can be found in the log path. This includes information about the compiled SQL statements that were triggered in your data platform. This sort of information can be very helpful for debugging issues in your code. One thing to note is that tables are created as transient by default in Snowflake. This is okay for development and testing, but you'll want to create permanent tables in production. You can do this by adding a configuration line to your dbtproject.yaml file. Now, let's connect to our data platform, in my case Snowflake, to verify the generated objects. The intermediate tables and views are created in the processing layer as expected. The final customer revenue table is also in good shape and ready for our business users to consume. Let's complete this video by validating the data lineage for our models. In Visual Studio, you can only see the immediate relationships. However, you can double-click on a particular model to view the next or previous level details. Furthermore, the dbt documentation feature, which we will learn about later, gives us end-to-end -end data lineage. That's all for now. In our next video, we'll cover more about dbt sources, seeds, and much more. So please stay tuned, and don't forget to like, share, and subscribe. Thanks for watching.